He doesn't need much introduction, but he really is uh, quite possibly one of the most famous chefs uh, in the world uh, of our modern times, and, and certainly one of the most successful chefs. Um, when I was young, I had his book, and et cetera, et cetera. So um, he's a different guy now, because uh, I saw him when he was uh, uh, in his restaurants, et cetera. Um, and here he is now, so I'm not going to uh, bang on too much about him. Marco, welcome, please. I've said all the right things. Please come up. Big round of applause. <laughs> How are you? Very good. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. How are you doing today? Just another day, isn't it? Yeah. Same every day. Is it? It is for me. Yeah. I like consistency. Yeah, right. I don't like inconsistency. Okay. So Get up in the morning, clean my teeth, have a shower, cup of tea, cup of coffee. Bingo. Very nice. Simple. Thank you for being here. You, um, you were born in Leeds, north of England, into a working class family. Your father, as mine, instilled in you a work ethic, discipline, and a never give up attitude. So can we start with the early days? That knock on the door at the Hotel St. George. What took you to the initial knock on the door and also that you never wanted that door knock to be answered? So, it must have been February 1978 and my father told me that I wasn't going to school today. So he told me not to put on my school uniform. He told me to put on my Sunday best. And I was going to Harrogate, which was about 15 miles away, which seemed a life, uh, you know, it seemed like the longest journey in my life because I'd never gone further than Harewood Bridge on the 36 bus. So I got on the 36 bus, I went past Harewood Bridge, and I went on to Harrogate. And my orders and my instructions from my father was to knock on the back doors of the hotel kitchens. So I arrived and I thought, where are all these kitchens? Where are all these hotels, sorry? And, um, I thought, I'll just walk down this hill. I got to the bottom of the hill, and there was a hotel on the corner called the Hotel St. George, an old Victorian building, looked rather pretty, rather posh. I walked alongside it, and I sort of peeped through the windows, and it was quite intimidating for me, because I'd never been anywhere so posh in my life. And I found the, the goods entrance. So I walked down the goods entrance, and I came to this backyard. There was a few cars parked. I thought, where's the kitchen door? And there's this turquoise door. I thought, that must be the kitchen. So I knocked on it. Nothing happened. And the truth is, there was a part of me which didn't want it to open. So I knocked again. And then the door opened. And it was Trevor, the kitchen porter. He said, what can I do for you, lad? I said, I've come to see the chef. So he guessed and assumed that I had an appointment, but I didn't have an appointment because lunch service had just started. I walked through this kitchen, there may have been 10, 12 chefs, all in whites, tall hats, and I was really intimidated. And I followed Trevor the kitchen porter to another turquoise door, which was open, he knocked on it, and chef said, Trevor, he said, there's a young man here to see you. He said, send him in. So I walked in, he told me to take a seat. Then he told me, what can I do for you? And I said, my father sent me to Harrogate to find work as an apprentice cook in the hotels. And he said, when do you leave school? And I said, I leave on the 17th of March. He said, when could you start? I said, the 20th of March. So he gave me the job. Like that. I was only in there for two minutes. Live in, 15 pounds a week, $30 in your money. And so I was relieved. So now I was going back to Leeds to tell my father that I'd got a job at the Hotel St. George in Harrogate. And I start on the 20th of March. What was interesting about that really was one of the defining moments of my life because it took me from a council estate, which I've never returned to, into a, it catapulted me into a middle class world. I had a living job in Harrogate. And so I'd escaped that world that I was born into. And I started on the morning of the 20th at 7.30, and I was 
I was terribly stressed. But I didn't know whether I was stiff through starch within my chest, why it's all stiff through fear. And that's the God's honest truth. And I did my initiation, which was to pass the beef stock, because in those days it was beef stock, it wasn't veal stock. But it was jellyfied. And at 7.30 I started passing the veal stock through a chinois. And at 11.30 I hadn't achieved very much. And I saw this pair of shoes, well polished, and chef's trousers. And I looked up, and chef said, how are you getting on? I said, okay, chef. He said, but why are you trying to pass jellyfied beef stock through a chinois? And I said, because that's what I was told, chef. He said, no, 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 you don't do it like that. You put it on the stove, bring it to the boil, simmer for 10 minutes, then you just pour it through the chinois. So I realized that was my initiation. Yeah. <laughs> Putting me in my place. And, um, and so it was just a job for me, that's the truth. It was just a job. And in the afternoons, I used to go and work with the hall porters, Ken and Bill. I used to polish the client's shoes. Because in those days, a lot of the chefs in the kitchen were in their 40s, their 50s, their 60s. Because in those days, very few chefs became a head chef. Because there was more establishments than the, there was less establishments than there were chefs. So chefs tended to specialize in being a chef poissonnier, being a chef uh, saucier, being an entremetier, uh, a gamanger, patisserie. And so I was just a commie and I got pushed around the kitchen wherever I was needed. Um, and one day I walked into the hall porter's lodge to polish the shoes. I was only 16 years old. And where I sat, there was this little book. And on the front of it, it said, The Eganry Guide to Hotels and Restaurants in Great Britain. And so I flicked through this little book. And I noticed one thing. Restaurants had stars. I didn't realize restaurants had stars. I knew hotels had stars, but I didn't realize restaurants had stars. And what I then realized was the best restaurant in Britain was a restaurant with three stars, which was about 15 miles down the road, called the Box Street in Ilkley in West Yorkshire. So I walked back into the kitchen that evening and thought to myself, if I'm going to be a cook, maybe I should work in the best restaurant in Britain. A month went by, two months went by, three months went by, four months went by. And then one day I plucked up the courage to contact them for work. And this was a real defining moment in my life. The day I approached them for work was the day a young man in the kitchens of the box tree had given his notice. So I got an interview because to get a job at the box tree in those days was as rare as hen's teeth, just impossible. So I got a job there and um, the head chef had trained in the same kitchens as my father, had done his apprenticeship years previous. Um, Mr. Reed and Mr. Long, on reflection, were the greatest influence in my life. Mr. Lawson took me under his wing, Mr. Lamb. And that's where my love for food started, in that little restaurant with three, with three stars eagerly, but it also had two stars in Michelin, which I didn't know. I didn't know what Michelin were. And in those days, there was only Four restaurants in Britain with two stars, no three stars, and about eight one stars. So Britain in the late 70s was a gastronomic desert. It really was. And there I was, from the world that I came, all of a sudden in one of the great restaurants of Britain. And that's when it all started for me, and that love affair. And the most important part of that time at the box I spent, we had to say goodnight to the bosses. And so we'd finish service, we'd get changed, but all the rest of the boys in the kitchen would run to the Rose and Crown for last orders and get a pint. Because we all had to go upstairs and say goodnight to the bosses. So they used to always send me up first. One, because I, was, I wasn't old enough to go into a pub. And secondly, I was quite happy. Because what they would do is they'd tell me stories about the great restaurants of France. La Serre, Taivon, La Grande Vifor, Maxime's. They'd talk about other restaurants like Bocuse, La Trois Gros, um, Charles Barrier. And so, but they spoke in such a visual way that I was almost there. And they really inspired me. And um, then they told me about the great restaurants in London, like La Gavroche, Ma Cuisine, La Tante Claire, Interlude du Tabayot. So they just filled me with knowledge and on reflection, what I've learned in my life, stories are way more important than recipes. Stories can inspire you. Recipes, they can confuse you.
you talk about luck a lot. And, you know, your career is being full of persever perseverance, resilience, and courage. You said in the past, success is born out of luck. It is. So to, tell us about these lucky well, moments. Well, had I not knocked on the door of the Hotel St. George, I may never have found that little guide by Egan Ronnie. Had I not chosen the day to approach the box tree, when that young man gave his notice, maybe I'd never have had an interview. So success is born out of luck. Luck is being given the opportunity. It's awareness of mind that takes advantage of that opportunity. It's like when I left Box Tree, or before I left Box Tree, I wrote to two restaurants for a job. I wrote to La Gavroche, and I wrote to an ex-chef of Gavroche who was at a restaurant called Chewton Glen in the New Forest. He had one star, Gavroche had two stars. But I liked his touch, he had a very delicate touch. So I wrote to these two establishments. Gavroche sent me an application back in French. I tried to fill it in. I made a mess of it. So that went in the bin. So I felt that that was my chance of getting a job at Gavroche over. Tutor and Glenn wrote back to me and invited me for uh, an interview. So I get the coach from Leeds to Victoria Station in London. I go from Victoria Station to Waterloo train station. I get the train to New Milton. I get my interview and I'm offered a job in the pastry. The truth is, I don't like sticky fingers. Pastry doesn't really do it for me. I understand the importance and accept the importance of it, but pastry is not for me. So I said, I'll think about it. So I get back to the train station, I've missed my train, so I get the next train back to London. I get to London and now it's nightfall. And there I am in Waterloo train station, thinking, how do I get to Victoria coach station from here? Because I was a country boy, really. I'd spent my childhood in the countryside, not in the city. So I saw this royal mailman. And I said to this royal mailman, Sir, how do I get to Victoria Coach Station, please? And he said to me, I'm going there, jump in. So I jumped into the royal mailman, and he took me all the way to Victoria Coach Station. By the time I got there, I'd missed my coach back to Yorkshire. So I had to walk the streets. So I walked out of the back of uh, Victoria Coach Station. I thought, what do I do here? So I thought, I'll walk up this road. And I walked up this road to these traffic lights. And I thought, I'll turn right. So I turned right, and I walked up a road called Pimlico Road, as I know it today. And I thought, if I keep on turning right, I'll just go around in a large circle. It sounds logical, but it's actually illogical. So I turn right, and I walk up. I come to another set of traffic lights, which is Pimlico Road, Royal Hospital Road, Chelsea Bridge Road, Lower Sloan Street. So I turn up Lower Sloan Street. I walk about 150 meters, 120 meters, and I find myself looking through the windows of this very smart restaurant. I can see it's smart by the waiters, by the service, putting the food down. And I look at the name above the door, and the name above the door said La Gavroche. I thought, wow, this is the restaurant of Albert Roux. This is the restaurant I wrote to that sent me the application which I messed up. I said, I'll go back in the morning. So I go back in the morning about nine o'clock. I knock on the back kitchen door. There's no answer. I knock on the back kitchen door again. And a boy called Baloo, he, was the, he did the, the preparation for the pastry for the evening service because Gavroche was only open. Welcome to that. So he said, I'm sorry, Gavroche doesn't open for lunch. He only does five nights a week. And then he said, but you should go to the head office. I said, where's the head office? He says, you go back down Lower Stone Street, Chelsea Bridge Road, over Chelsea Bridge, Wandsworth uh, Queenstown Road, and when you get to the top of Queenstown Road, you'll see Wandsworth Road, and you turn left there. Sounds simple. No, 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 no. I get lost immediately. And I find myself on the embankment, and I see in the distance this bridge. I think that must be Chelsea Bridge. So I walk along the embankment, and there it is, Chelsea Bridge. So I cross Chelsea Bridge, I walk down Chelsea Bridge Road, <clears throat> and I come to the start of Queenstown Road. So I'm back on track. But then I make another mistake. I turn off left, which was a mistake, because I was told to go to the top of Queenstown Road and turn left. So I turn off left. 
I walk up this road, I haven't got a clue where I am. When I get to the top of this road, I now realize I'm on Wandsworth Road. But I see to my left, a shabby office saying R-O-U-X, Rue. I thought, wow. So I walk, I knock on the door and walk in. And to, on the left, behind his desk, is Albert Rue. I'd never seen him in the flesh before, but I recognized him through photos. He said, what can I do for you, lad? So I told him my entire, my entire story, leaving Yorkshire at 4.30 in the morning, coming to London. I told him about that I'd written to you, in, uh, written to you for, and you sent me an application back in French. I'd messed it up, so I had to take my other uh, interview at Tewton Glen. I go to Tewton Glen, they've offered me a job in the pastry. I said, I'll think about it. I come back to London. I miss my coach back to Yorkshire. He must have thought I was a complete and utter lunatic. <laughs> I mean, it's not the way an interview should go, is it really? Let's be honest. And so he just asked me a very simple question. He said, where do you work? <laughs> Never thought about that one. So I said, I work at the Box Street Ilkley in West Yorkshire. He said, I had the best meal of my life in Britain at the Box Street in Ilkley in West Yorkshire. He said, how long have you been there? I said, nearly two and a half years. So then, he employed me, and I started work at Le Gavroche. And that's how I got into London, by pure default. Got my job at the Hotel St. George, by default. Got my job at the Box Street, by default. Got my job at Gavroche, by default. And had I not made all those mistakes, and luck, was on, and luck hadn't been on my side, I wouldn't be sitting here today. But I knocked the first hotel, I said it wasn't very good food, and it was just a job. But can I just say one thing? Had I not started in that hotel, then I would never have achieved what I achieved in my life because they taught me how to use a knife well. They taught me how to run. They taught me how to say yes, chef. They taught me how to be consistent. Even though it wasn't great food, I was consistent. And so you have to take the knowledge out of each and individual establishment you work in. When luck lands in front of you or it presents itself to you, you have to take full advantage Tell of it. Tell us about the luck of Harvey's, opening Harvey's, the £67,000 loan and how that all started for you? Well, that was another disaster. <laughs> so I was at the Manwara Castazon as Raymond Blong's sous chef. I finish in um, 86 in Manwara and I come to London. I'm on my way to Paris. I asked my friend Alan Bennett if he could look, look, put me up for a week to sort things out to get to Paris. He said he won't be there on the morning when I arrive, but he'll leave his, the keys to the restaurant and his apartment, which was above the restaurant, in the ironmongers next door. So I arrive from Oxford, I get the keys, I go into the restaurant, lock the door, open the door to his apartment, I go upstairs. And there's really no, there's a TV, there's a three-piece suite, and there's a desk. Anyway, he comes home, and he sits down, and he's very honest with me. He says, him and his wife have separated. Uh, things are tough, business is tough. And he said, Marco, could you help me? So I worked for six months for him for nothing. In the end, he went bust. But I worked for him. But every Monday night, two men used to come to the restaurant. And I just used to use what was left from the weekend and do a daily menu. And they used to ask me just to cook for them, just do a menu for them. So that's what I did. And then... Alan went bust, so I had to think of new plans, a new strategy. So I went to the West End, I got a job which paid me cash in hand, and they paid me £400 a week. So £400 a week in 86 cash, which is $800, was a lot of money. But I lied all the way through my interview. I just made up my CV. I didn't let them know that I come from a two-star, three-star Michelin world. So I go into the kitchen, there's three chefs, one's been there 45 years, who's um, Italian, Signor Sacconi. One's been there sort of 42 years called Andrea, and one's been there like 40 years called Giuseppe, who's Sicilian and a complete lunatic, an alcoholic. <laughs> and then there's me and the Polish kitchen port who'd been there like 30 years as well. So they looked at me like a foreign body. What am I doing here? So the proprietor could see that I was a bit different to maybe some of the chefs he'd had before. So he used to give me two bottles of wine every lunch and two bottles of wine every dinner. 
And what I had to do is one white, one white wine, one red wine, and make a special, and then one white wine, one red wine, and make a special for dinner. Well, they were all alcoholics, so I used to give them the alcohol, and I used to make two specials without alcohol. So then they took me under their wing. They loved me. It was a foreign body who now is loved by them because they used to get hammered every day. <laughs> and so then I get a phone call one day at Quivardis from Nigel, who was one of the two men who I used to feed every Monday night. So we'd like to see you, Mark, and we might have uh, a proposition for you. So Mr. Carr and, and Nigel, I went to see them. And they were opening a restaurant on Wandsworth Common. And they said what they had to say. But this is how thick I am again. I thought they were asking me to invest. What they were doing was offering me a head chef's job. So I said I haven't got the money. They were in for 350000 with no chef. And they wanted to open. So then they said to me, don't worry about it, Marco. We'll borrow £67,000 for you and we'll PG it. PG means personal guarantee. I said, okay. So I got a job and I got 33% of a restaurant. And that's how I got into business, by pure default, by not understanding. <laughs> Simple as that. So in March 87, I believe... No, January 87 I opened. Is it, say that again, January 87. January 87, I opened. Yeah, in March 87, you were nearly broke. It nearly went broke, is that right? Well, what was interesting is, so I opened in January 87. The Michelin Guide in those days came out in 87. So I wasn't in the, in the 87 Guide. So now, one month goes by, two months goes by, and we're doing no covers, minimal. And then what happens is... This is Harvey's. This is Harvey's. Yeah. Then what happens is... It's a life-changing moment. I told you when I was a young boy of 16 at the Hotel St. George, I found a little guide saying the Egan Ray Guide to Hotels and Restaurants in Great Britain. Two, two and a half months later, Egan Ray, the most powerful food critic in Britain, and most respected, walks through my doors. And I cook for the great Egan Ray. Then Egan Ray asked me, if you could meet me afterwards. So I went out to meet the great Egan Ronnie. And he was more fascinated by my name, Marco White. He said, you must have Italian blood. I said, well, my mother's Italian, my father's English, and my actual name is Marco Pierre White. But I just use the, I don't use the, the name Pierre. So what happened was, a, a couple of weeks later, a whole page in the Sunday Times came out, which is a broadsheet. And the headline was about the young chef who has an English, Italian, and French name. And they wrote kind things about the food. From that day on, Harvey's was full. It was just, had he not walked through my door, the truth is, I would have gone bust. So I was lucky. And so therefore, luck, once again, presents itself. And you have to, you have to, um, Acknowledge luck when it's presented to you, or opportunity, whatever you want to call it. I call it luck. Something else luck, happened there, didn't it? Michael Caine. Ah, so a few years later. So in 88, I won my first star in Michelin. In 1990, I won my second star in Michelin. Michael Caine walks through my door, the actor. And I cook for him. Because... My great friend was a boy called Stephen Saltzman. And Stephen Saltzman's father owned the rights to the Bond movies. So he was a customer. I got to know him. His father owned the rights to the Bond movies and then did a deal with Cubby Broccoli. The rest is history. And so Stephen brings Michael Caine to my restaurant with his wife, Shakira. I get to know them. They're very nice people. And we opened up a restaurant together called The Canteen, which went a mission style. But more importantly, what Michael did, and without Michael's assistance, I would never have gone to the other side of the river, because I was on the south side. And so it, Michael brings Sir Rocco Forty to the Harveys. Rocco Forty was the chief exec of the Forty Hotel Group, which was the largest hotel group in the world. He's got the old grill room, in the Hyde Park Hotel, which is today the Mandarin Oriental. 
and ask me if I'd like to take a lease. So I go and see the room. I look at the back of house. I tell them I need more room for kitchen. So I do the deal. I go to the Hyde Park. We open on the 1st of September, 1993. I've got one month to get back to a two-star standard. But what I have to do is I have to increase the front of house by uh, 60%. So we had five in the front of house at Harvey's, we went to 15. Five in the kitchen, we went to 15. So we've now got another, an extra 20 staff. So apart from just putting your energy into 20 staff to teach them your ways and to get the standard back on track. And we were very busy from day one. We were doing 130, 140 meals a day. Because the Michelin guy went to press in the October. We have three inspections by Michelin in that first month. In 1994, the Michelin guide comes out. We retained our two stars in Michelin. But we've gone from three knives and forks to four knives and forks. So then I said to myself, is it within us to win three stars? And we've got the right establishment and the right team. I built the team a little bit in kitchen and in front of the house. So we pushed hard that year. January 1995, we win our three stars in Michelin. We win our four black knives and forks. For a month, I sort of lost direction because I'd realized my, I'd realized winning three stars. But when I was, let's go back to when I was a boy at the box tree when the boys used to run to the pub for the last pint. And I used to go upstairs and talk to the bosses. They told me about one restaurant called La Serre. And La Serre was the only, it was head and shoulders, you say, above every other restaurant in France. It had three stars in Michelin and five red knives and forks. Because you go one to five in black. And the red ones are very extraordinary. So I then make another decision because of the misfortune of 40s. 40s were taken over in a hostile takeover. The whole company was broken up. Sold off as Meridian, sold off as this, sold off as individual. But there was one opportunity within that. And that was a dining room that had five red knives and forks. There was two restaurants in London with two red knives and forks, but one of them had a star, one of them had no stars. So the Ritz had no stars. The, the Meridian in the Hotel Piccadilly had one star under the guidance of Michel Laurent, who was a, a three-star chef in France. So I do the deal to move from the Hyde Park to the Meridian. Again, we up it again. So we've now got over 30 chefs in the kitchen. We've now got nearly 50 out front. We had eight wine waiters. All wine lists were handwritten. It used to take the head wine waiter two months to write all the wine lists. So if you imagine opening the page on Petrus, over 100 vintages straight. You go to Chateau Ecam, 150 vintage of Chateau Ecam. You go to Petrus, which in Rothschild, Chateau Blanc, over 100 cent, um, finishes of that, so it was like a Bible, really. Each menu in those days used to cost 25 pounds to make for one, one menu. That's $50 today. Let's go back 20, 20, 25 years ago. Is the, um, which was press paper with deckled edging. Very elegant, very smart. Our flower bill was 5,000 pounds a week. Our cellar was mostly worth 5 million sterling. That's $10 million today. So we did everything, and we, then we had the art collection. And so therefore, you walked into a temple. Because I think when you walk into a three-star Michelin, it should be a temple of gastronomy. Metaphorically speaking, you bow. You can't help yourself, you bow. And you watch the show. And then what we introduced there was serving in the room. So we might do the milk-fed lamb for two. Um, we might do the daub de boeuf in the big pot where it's served at the table. So we, we, we developed that. So we started to bring theater into the room in, uh, like they would in the old three-star restaurants. And then in 98, we won our three stars with five red knives and forks. So I'd realized my entire dream. I'd replicated the restaurant which I'd never been to. Three stars, five red knives and forks. As simple as that. You were given some advice after that from, I think, uh, was it Rocco Forte? What, tell me what, remind me what the advice was. I've been well, given advice all my life. Well, was it about remember what gave you three stars? 
Yeah, I do remember that. I do. Yeah, it's, it's um, and... Because it's a big, it, 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 it changed things for you. Well, it changed everything, really, because winning three stars, winning five red knives and forks, you know, the only restaurant in over 40 years of Michelin in Britain to have three stars and five red knives and forks, I'd realised my dream. But the problem is, winning three stars is the most exciting journey of any chef's life. It really is. The great Michel Nejelan, who was the boss of the entire, entirety of Europe, no one can give two or three stars away except Nejelan. So you're the, you're the head inspector of Michelin England, UK. You can only give one star away. All you can do is make recommendations for two and three stars, and then the French boys would come over. So you had consistency across Europe. And I'd won my three stars. I'd realized my dream, replicated La Serre. As I said, winning three stars is the most exciting journey in the world for any young chef. Nejelan said it takes a chef eight to 10 years to win three stars. The reason why it takes that long is to prove consistency. You can go to a restaurant today which is two star and you can get a three star meal. You go back there in three months time and you get a two star meal. Every meal has got to be three stars. I once said to the head inspector of Michelin, Mr. Derek Brown, why did Gavroche lose their three stars? He said, I dined there four times last year. Three of the meals weren't three stars. So it shows you they do inspect you at that high level, mostly more than they do the, the people at one star. And um, so now I've got three stars, five red knives and forks. Trust me when I say this, it's boring. <laughs> because you've won your three stars, the excitement's over. So you're not playing an attacking game. What you're playing is a defensive game because there you are protecting your position. And so you've got this well-oiled machine. Some of the staff have been with me 12 years, 10 years, eight years, nine years. They've been on that entire journey with me. And it's almost like a conveyor belt. It just comes out, comes out, comes out. And I thought it was rather boring. So one Sunday morning, I thought I'd go salmon fishing. I go down to the river test at the mouth of the river, Testwood Pool, near Southampton. I catch, I catch a salmon, unhook it, release it. Whenever I caught a salmon, I'd always rest the pool, light a fag, and just have a little think. And this little interesting thought came into my mind. And that thought was, well, to you, I'll come back. So now I'm thinking of maybe bailing out. Option one. Continue what you're doing, working six days a week, over 100 hours a week. You've got your status, you've got your set income. You sit on top of the Christmas tree. That's option one. Option two is live a lie and pretend you cook when you don't cook. Charge high prices, but you're not in your kitchen. Question your own integrity and what you stand for and what you represent. I came from a world where chefs were behind their stove and behind their pass. Option three is pluck up the courage to give your stars back. Accept that you're unemployed. Accept you've handed back your status and everything you've ever worked for. They were my three options. Number one, I'm not a liar, so I can't do option two. So I've got option one and option three. So I catch this sound, I release it, I light a fag. And this thought comes into my head. No matter how much I like Mr. Brown and respect him, Michel Nejela is number two. The truth is, they don't have the knowledge I have when it comes to food and cooking. So therefore you've got to say the obvious to you. The obvious to yourself is if you're given something by somebody who has less knowledge than yourself, what's it worth? It's not worth a carrot, is it? It's your insecurities that place this value on it. But those little stepping, those little Michelin stars were the stepping stones to where I wanted to be. And if I still had a three-star restaurant today, the truth is I wouldn't be sitting here. I'd be behind my stove, behind my pass. And the truth is, on reflection of my life. <clears throat>
I never won three stars. That is the truth. I never won them. It was the team behind me, the young men and the young women, who won the three stars. They created the symphony. They were the orchestra. I was just the composer and the conductor. I was one little link within that chain like they were. So therefore, they created my dream and realized my dream. And in return, I showed them what was possible. And if you're going to be a great chef, you've got to be a Pied Piper. You've got to make people follow you. Believe in your dream. Believe in your vision. It's as simple as that. So, that's an amazing story. We have time for three questions from the audience. Anyone? Because if you don't ask, I'll keep asking. Because I've got a whole lot to ask. Anyone? Yes. Madam, what's your name? Lucy. Great name, with, a, with an I or a Y? With a Y. Posh. <laughs> Love that. No, I think the truth is, whether it's life or whether it's food, you have to make mistakes. And through making mistakes, you have to take the knowledge out of the mistake, out of life. And that's what makes us who we are today. I could list hundreds and thousands of mistakes I've made in my life. And there's nothing wrong in making mistakes. But you have to take the knowledge from the experience. And that's how we grow. Next question. Madam, then we'll come to you, sir. My dream as a, what was your name, madam? Kinion. Kinion. Thank you. My dream as a young man was to be a river keeper, a gamekeeper, to work in the outside, to work in the countryside. That was my dream. And if I think back to my life, had I not spent my entire childhood with nature, I would never have had the appreciation for natural produce as I do. And also I think, you know, as I say in life, great chefs have three things in common. One, they accept and they respect that Mother Nature is a true artist. And they are just a cook. Secondly, everything that they do is just an extension of them as a person. And thirdly, they give you great insight into the world they were born into, the world which inspired them, and they serve it on their plates. And so you have to dig down deep into your childhood and look at all those things which inspired you. Um, what advice would you give to young chefs um, looking to make it in the industry, um, like such as yourself, um, make a high standard for themselves? I think the first thing you've got to do is be brutally honest with yourself and ask yourself, is it good enough? Am I fast enough? Do I work hard enough? Do I push hard enough? Do I drive myself? You think you work hard? Never work hard. I used to say to myself, do I work hard? I don't work hard enough. Am I fast? I'm not fast enough. Am I consistent? I'm not consistent enough. So I was very hard on myself. Really, really hard on myself. But what you have to do is understand what drives you. Because once you understand what drives you, then you start to have an understanding of yourself. And what drove me as a young man was my fear of failure. What fueled me were my insecurities. Questioning, I'm not good enough, I'm not good enough, I'm not good enough. So I never tried to be creative. I just believe we live in a world of refinement, not invention. The more you do to food, the more you take away from food. So you have to be brutally honest. If you look at my hands, what do you see? You see a palm, don't you? I see four knuckles. We're looking at the same thing, but we see something very different. So never allow the obvious to blind you. Never kid yourself. Be brutally honest to yourself. It's not good enough. It's not three stars. It's not two stars. It's not one star. So if your dream is a one-star restaurant, be honest with yourself. If you want two stars, be honest with yourself. If you want three stars, be honest with yourself. But invest the time. If you have to work 100 hours a week, then do it to create that consistency that you require. And as my first bosses at the box tree said to me, said, Marco, it doesn't matter how much it costs, as long as you create the desired effect. So to do that, you have to 
make personal sacrifice. So, Marco, on that, sorry to interrupt, but in this country at the moment, we have um, some issues in our industry of hours, salary, wages, etc. Now, hopefully everyone in this room knows that to get somewhere, it doesn't come overnight, it's not going to be delivered to you on a silver platter. What are your thoughts, or how does someone get to where they want to be, but there's also some restrictions in the way? Well, I think it should be left up to the individual to choose. I don't think it should be left to the people in, in Parliament. Agree, totally. If a young man or a young lady wants to work 60, 70, 80 hours a week, they should be able to sign a little piece of paper saying, bang, I want to do that to obtain the knowledge. Can you imagine? I mean, like in England, they're looking at a 32-hour week. When will you ever achieve your dream? Let's be honest. You have to work hard. You have to work really hard to learn your trade. You have to push yourself. Doing 32 hours a week, 40 hours a week, you know, it's going to take you twice as long. It's about developing yourself, and the individual should be allowed, in my opinion, to sign a waiver that I'm happy working 60, 70 hours a week, rather than being told I've got to work 40 hours a week. Mm. And by the way, look, let's be honest. The harder you work, the more hours you do, the less money you spend. You've got all this time off, you're skint. <laughs> you're struggling to pay your rent at the end of the month. I'm sorry. And that's my honest belief. A young man or a young woman who has a dream, has a vision, should be allowed to sign a waiver and say, I want to do the hours. I want to work in that establishment. <clears throat> well, that's what I think. Sadly. We should be given choices rather than told. We're only allowed to work 40 hours a week or 30, what is it here? 38 hours a week. 38. <clears throat> I did that in two days. <laughs> so we should be allowed to sign a waiver rather than being dictated to. We're only allowed to work 30 hours a week. Because you know something? You get paid for 32 hours. Say you do 60 hours. You, for those 12 hours you work, you, you're being paid by knowledge. Well said. Well said. So, um, sadly, we're out of time. We could go on all day. Thank you. I hope I didn't bore you too much. I would like to um, thank you very much for your time. One of, uh, you know, the most famous chefs <laughs> of our modern time and uh, for sharing your insights. It's been an incredible journey. Luck. Recognize it when you see it. Trust me. Because we're all given it. It's whether we take advantage. I know why my father sent me to Harrogate. And this is the last thing I'll say. I know why my father sent me to Harrogate. Because he was offered a job by a French chef in the Grand Hotel by a man called Paul Lebarbe. But he didn't have the courage to take the job. So I went to Harrogate. And I was filming there about three years ago. And I went to the, st the, the, I went to the spot where I got off the bus to look for all these hotels. And I looked over these trees, because it sort of drops away, over these trees, and in the distance, I saw the Grand Hotel in Harrogate. I thought, wow, that's where my father was offered a job. Then the penny dropped. That's why he sent me to Harrogate, to relive the dream that he never took advantage of. And that's why you have to take advantage of luck when you see it. I hope you enjoyed your, your few moments with me because I've, and thank you for your respect and your patience. Thank you. Thank you.